Our speaker today, Coleman Elridge III, is a, I could quote from the program, I don't want to read the whole program. Uh, Coleman is a Transylvania University graduate, he's a Sullivan University graduate, his sister's a Sullivan University graduate, his mother and his aunt are here joining us today. Um, he is a public servant, a person who really deeply feels his service to people and to the Commonwealth. I don't want to take anything more away from his speech. Let's welcome our speaker today, Coleman Elridge III. Good morning. Let's try it again. We're in church. I know it's Saturday, but good morning. Good morning. All right. That sounds like some graduates are ready to get the show on the road. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be with you this morning. And I know this is being live streamed and I, I knew that before. So if I can take a moment of personal privilege, Coleman and Carter, listen to your mother and eat breakfast now. <laughs> Daddy is real and this is not recorded. <laughs> Thank you all. So some of the parents that are graduating today understand what just had to happen. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Chancellor, Mr. President, members of the Sullivan University Administration, distinguished faculty and staff, friends and family, and to you, my soon-to-be fellow Sullivan alumnus, it is an honor to be with you today, celebrating your personal achievement, professional probability, and to celebrate a brighter future for our Commonwealth and our nation made possible by your investment and an education. Now, for the next few moments, I am your commencement speaker, and I hope not to bore you, but if I do, please do not tweet it or Facebook it, because when I left the house this morning, my wife still does not actually believe I am here. What she told me was, Coleman, I have been listening to you talk for the last 12 years. I can't imagine anyone would invite you to do that. <laughs> so another point of personal privilege, honey, I'm actually here. Uh, conversely, if you like something I said, go ahead and shout it from the rooftops because out of 12 years, I would like to win an argument just once. <laughs> Not too long ago, I was seated exactly where you are. In 2006, my sister Colleen and I made the decision that we would enter Sullivan's MBA program together. And together, we survived everything from statistics to Ken Miller. <laughs> Those of you who have had Ken understand there's a survival course and group. As we sat in the seats that you now occupy this morning, we talked not so much of the future, but of the past. The past that solidified our bond, a past wrapped, yes, in being siblings, but also the expectations we put on ourselves to succeed, even when the world around us did not necessarily believe that our possibility matched the probability of our success. How could we as young children, especially young children of color, especially young children of color who were poor, who had at times been homeless, who had known the sting of hunger, who at times were ridiculed by these perceived indignities of poverty, how could we dare to dream of life outside of cyclical poverty? Very simply, actually. You see, for all that we did not have, we were blessed with, and I feel as though in this place I can say this, we were blessed with a God who saw in us limitless probability, and so his mercy did not abandon us. We were blessed with a mother who is here this morning, who did not let the circumstances of our life, as hard as they were at times, limit the aspirations that we had. Even in the midst of poverty, poverty was no excuse for abandoning a work ethic that my mother would tell us was the very essence of what it meant to bear the last name of Elridge. Even in the midst of struggle, our living at times in a motel was never an excuse to not excel at our schoolwork and our extracurricular activities. Life is not easy, my mother would say, but every day you are alive is a day to fight for the future you want. Education, she rightly believed, 
would be the transformative investment in our lives. Education, she rightly advocated, did not care whether or not we were black or white, rich or poor, born into a family with a famous last name or a name destined to be famous. Education, she reminded us, was the great equalizer. And so in the moments before our names were called, we sat on this side of the uh, auditorium and we talked about those moments. How did we get here? How was she at that moment already half a decade into a career in human resources? How was I at that moment a 26-year-old executive assistant and senior advisor to a governor? We wondered and we laughed and had to contain our composure at times, but all the while we understood that we were sitting there having seemingly halted the cycle of poverty in our lives and for future generations of our family because we placed a priority on education. We dared very rightly, as you have done, to snatch probability out of the jaws of possibility. Now, I know people talk about the limitless possibilities of the world, and they are not incorrect, but let me paint the following picture. We all could have the possibility of winning the lottery. We have that saying, if you play, you could win. The possibility of winning, or the probability of winning, however, is sometimes between one in a million and one in 64 million. So when you ask if I would want the possibility of success, or through hard work and dedication and doors of opportunity being opened and having the courage to walk through those doors, obtain the probability of success, I will always choose the probability of success. And as I look now for all that we have been through at my sons, Coleman and Carter, who are five and four and actively trying to kill me, <laughs> we're family now, so I can tell you the following. This is what happened this morning, is that I was getting, I was getting some things ready to, to come, and, and my boys were, were, were up early, and, and my youngest, Carter, you don't know him, but he rules the world, uh, he said, Daddy, I'm hungry. And so I, I fixed him a Pop-Tart. And I said, now, son, eat your Pop-Tart. You, what do you want to drink? He wanted some milk. I then am about to leave, and I hear milk going down the drain and a Pop-Tart, half of a Pop-Tart being thrown away. At that moment, I had to remind my children that they are technically both poor and homeless. And we in our household do not throw away half Pop-Tarts. You put it in a Ziploc bag and you wait it out. <laughs> Mom, I know you think they can do no wrong, but I just blasted them on the internet. The probability of their lives being stronger and better has increased because my wife and I dared to dream that we could be better for them and do better by them through the empowerment of an education. And you have taken the steps to ensure that the probability of your future is not merely what you have allowed yourself to dream, but I will tell you because of this investment, you have made your future so much more bright that you will actually, and you may not believe it now, exceed your imagination. And so today we are here to celebrate you. And we are celebrating, as has been said before, your journey to this moment and to share with you and to dream with you and to desire with you a better version and vision of yourselves emboldened by the degrees and certificates that you will receive today and the right and responsibility you have to not passively wait for the future to happen, but through the transformative power of an education, turn your dreams into a firm reality. Your accomplishments to get here to this moment are the main indicator that the education, the discipline that you have to be successful is real. But that does not mean that it will always be easy. We live in a world where having a degree does not instantly guarantee you employment, and if it does, it does not guarantee you that you will be employed at the level of your worth. 
And I will tell you that it is not always easy having made this investment in yourselves, not only academically, but financially and personally, only to find that the market sometimes did not value the rightness of your decision to get a higher education. And while I cannot tell you that life is always going to be easy for this investment, what I can tell you very assuredly is it will all but assuredly be harder had you not. And so while paying back those student loans may take some of your disposable income away, as a professor some one time told me, you may, not, you may have to defer that vacation to the south of France to instead go to the south of Paris, Kentucky. <laughs> We're not playing for the short, short term here. We are playing a long-term game. Many of you have seen the challenges not only in your personal life, but your professional life as well. Some of you come here this morning knowing the realities of poverty, of fear, of all of those statistics that tell us that we should not dare to have the dignity of dreaming of a better life. But you are here, having snatched victory and resilience out of the mouth of possible defeat. I know that path. We are battle-worn for some of the naysayers, battle-scarred from late-night homework assignments and papers that just never seemed right. We are battle-tested, but as we sit here today, we sit here victorious. And so we come here today to celebrate you, not only for your accomplishments at this point, professionally and personally, but for what it means for our commonwealth and for our nation. As the president said, for almost eight years, I was blessed to serve at one of the highest levels of government in our commonwealth. And I saw firsthand the transformation of Kentucky from an often cartoonish characterization in media outlets to a beacon light for people all across our nation and throughout our world who saw Kentucky as a place to receive a better post-secondary education, to start and grow a family, and to start and grow a business. Our ability as a commonwealth to shape our future, seize the opportunity to lead the 21st century, is empowered by our recognition that first and foremost, we must be empowered through education. And whether that investment starts in early childhood education, extends itself to have raised the dropout age from 16 to 18, or beginning to talk about a college or a, a cradle to career pipeline, and that college in the four years since of it may not be for everyone, but when we talk about the career or the, the cradle to career pipeline, we do so with an expectation that our children will graduate from high school, will go on to some post-secondary educational opportunities. And that message has sent a signal throughout our commonwealth and our nation and our world that what we value most in this commonwealth is our human capital. We have made historic investments ensuring that our people, no matter where they live or where they come from, have access to quality and affordable health care. We have made investments in our infrastructure so that traveling across our highways and byways is safe, not only to go and visit family and to be here this morning to root them on, but to also grow economic development. We, have, we are in the process of laying, laying dark fiber throughout Kentucky to make sure that every business that wants to is competitive, not only in Kentucky and around the region that we live, but can honestly export their business and goods throughout the world. We are shaping the story of Kentucky to be one that is aspirational and powerful and bold and unrepentant. And we understand that we are not competing against the eight states that surround us or 49 other states that make up our union. We are competing with every state in our union, every nation in this world, and we cannot afford to lose the 21st century. And so you, by virtue of your accomplishments today, are part of that story. How we compete, how we win the 21st century is in no small way shaped by the success we celebrate in this moment. And I've always contended that when you complete your education, when you advance your education, it is one of the most patriotic acts you can participate in because every degree earned sends a warning shot to the rest of the world that our best days are not behind us, but they are continuously being built as each 
education accepts the opportunity and responsibility to define exceptionalism. And my friends, we are exceptional as a generation and as a commonwealth and as a nation. And so you are part of the fabric of that story. And so you are here, almost with a degree in hand, if I would just sit down and be quiet. <laughs> so before I take my seat, a couple of words of advice, because that's what we're supposed to do as commencement speakers. Today we celebrate you, but the world still turns, and tomorrow you will have to dream a new dream and work to make that dream a reality. So be bold. Those who accept or expect to be invited to the table of success will wait their entire lives. Be bold enough to assert your belief that with hard work and opportunity, what you aspire to be is not only going to happen, but it will shake the foundations of complacency. Now, there are limitations to that. While I would love to believe that we can all be the next Jennifer Lawrence or win the next season of The Voice, being a starving artist was never something I aspired to be. But even so, if that is your truth, live in it, seize your destiny, see it and own it, and do not be talked out of your destiny by those who do not have the courage themselves to be bold. Dream big. There's nothing worse than a dreamer who dreams small, who's not willing to put out into the universe the expectations of their lives and dare the world to stop them. <laughs> Understand that the world will only treat you if you allow the world to treat you. And so dream big and do not let what is get in the way of what can and should be. Work hard. You know, I've never understood people that said, showing up is half the battle. Show up, let me tell you, is not even a quarter of the battle. <laughs> showing up is okay, but those who are successful not only show up, but when they show up, they have made the investments in themselves to be prepared for the moment where that door of opportunity opens and to not only walk on the other side of that door, but stand firmly and not be moved. And finally, show gratitude and act with purpose. If life taught me anything is that we are not lonely islands. Those who tell you that they pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps are only telling half the story. They're missing the teacher who challenged them to be better, the person in the community who always believed in them, the spouse who watched the kids so they could go to night class, the employer who was okay with them doing work outside of what they were being paid for and still paid them anyway, the investor who believed in their idea and so they gave them a shot, the person who did not know them personally but invested in them anyway. We are not products of a lonely island. We are products of a community of people who touch our lives, who believe in us, even in the moments where we do not have the courage to believe in ourselves. And so, say thank you. And as you walk through that door, do not be so selfish as to slam that door behind you, but have the courage and the dignity to look up and out and at future generations and be an example and hold your hand out as someone held their hand out for you and pull them through. <laughs> be bold enough to be as a graduating class to not only think of your legacy as individuals but your legacy as a graduating class. What will it have meant for you to have been here? And while history may not recall and recount your names individually, dare to dream that because you worked hard and with focus and with determination, the world will be better because you were here. And so I'm here today on, four, on behalf of 
million Kentuckians. I'm here today on behalf of all Sullivan alumni to say thank you. For me, saying thank you starts with Marika Adams, who met with me and made me feel assured that I would find a good home here at Sullivan University. Dr. Ken Miller, who never gave up on me and challenged me to the point of me wanting to... <laughs> I love the man dearly. But he challenged me because he wanted me to be great, not because he thought I would be great, but because he understood my expectation for my life. And so we thank you for daring to be great, for seizing opportunity and creating probability, for being victorious and ensuring that our best days as a commonwealth, as a nation, and as a university are in front of us. May God bless you. May God continue to bless our Commonwealth and the United States of America. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of your day.